27th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles is remarkable on three levels. <clears throat> First of all, it's a masterpiece of inspiration. Uh, the account uh, demonstrates the historic and nautical accuracy of the narrative of the Acts of the Apostles. It contains, uh, as we shall see, many unperceived coincidences which betray an expert knowledge of the sea. And to my mind, there can be no doubt uh, that the hand which wrote this account was divine. Secondly, whilst Acts of the Apostles in chapter 27 looks to be just an incidental account of an epic journey resulting in, in a shipwreck and a deliverance from the sea, it's much more than that. It's a witness to the ways of providence. It reveals to us, brothers and sisters, the unseen hand of God uh, uh, controlling the wind, controlling the seas, and controlling men and women uh, to achieve his purpose. And lastly, the account is remarkable because it's a parable of the deliverance which we all hope for. You see, brothers and sisters, we are all journeying in a vessel, uh, and that vessel is Jesus Christ. And the parable of the void shows that unless we remain in the vessel, we cannot be saved. Now, our personal interest in this subject was aroused uh, firstly by a, a, a brother, Harold Smith, who was a, a black country brother. And he was a man of books and, uh, and an accomplished speaker. And in the late 70s, I guess, early 80s, he gave a Bible talk on Acts chapter 27, which as a young man, I remember to this day. And the source of his information uh, was a small book written by a, a, a maritime scholar called James Smith. And it's called The Voyage and the Shipwreck of Paul. And having always remembered Brother Harold's personal encouragement to me to collect books and to study, uh, much later in life, I secured a copy uh, of this book. And I just thought that although I don't um, possess Brother Harold's attention to detail or his meticulous historic knowledge uh, or his powers of oratory, uh, another generation would appreciate a similar study. Now, when we come to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, we see that verse 1 actually contains an ambiguity. It says, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. You see, Paul was a prisoner, and on the surface of things, it was determined by the Roman authorities that he should go to Rome uh, to appear before Caesar. But when we turn to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23, we find that there was a higher power than Festus who had determined beforehand that Paul was to travel to Rome. And you get this in, in, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23 and verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Do you notice, brothers and sisters, in the Acts of the Apostles, how many times it wasn't an angel, but it was Christ himself that stood by the Apostle. The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at, at Rome. And I put it to you that it was determined by God and not by Festus that Paul should go to Rome and that in this narrative, brothers and sisters, the Romans are merely the servants of providence used by God to bring his uh, beloved apostle uh, before Caesar. So, uh, brothers and sisters, <coughs> returning to, to verse 1, it was the determinate but the unseen counsel of God that caused Paul to be delivered to a, a centurion named Julius of the Augustus band. The expression in verse 1, when it says, we should sail into Italy, disguises in English one of the, the, the first of many specialist Greek nautical terms. 
Uh, the Greek word translated sail, apopleo, uh, literally means to plunge through the water. Uh, and it's an out and out nautical term that you, you can only approximate in English. Now, critics of the Bible, brothers and sisters, make the point that this word is unique to Luke's writings. And it is true, it is uni unique in the scriptures to the writings of Luke. Uh, and from that, they venture uh, to suggest uh, that it was Luke that chose this nautical term. And we, uh, brothers and sisters, disagree with that conclusion. Luke wrote under inspiration. It is God, brothers and sisters, our heavenly father, who is the master of the seas, who chose the language to describe this epic voyage. God made the sea. He controls the sea with his power. He shut, shuts up the sea with doors and his way is in the sea and his path is in great waters. This, brothers and sisters, is the product of inspiration. And so coming to verse two, we find that they entered a ship of Adramitium and we launched, <coughs> meaning to sail, by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, uh, be, be, being with us. And so we see the pronoun we. Luke was with him, and also a, a brother called Aristarchus, uh, a Macedonian of Thess Thessalonica, who at this stage accompanied him as, as, a free, as a free man. Now this ship, was doubtless homeward bound. It was going back to Adramitium, uh, and her course would have taken her past the principal seaports of Asia, which is, is really the West, what, what we now know as Western, Western Turkey. And Paul had sailed that route before, but he'd sailed it in reverse. So let's go now to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21, and you will see that uh, Paul, an experienced uh, sea, uh, sea traveller, had actually gone from the coast of, of, of uh, Western Turkey, from Ephesus in particular, and had sailed uh, back uh, to, uh, to Phoenicia. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 21. It came to pass, after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came, and he was at this point at Ephesus, we came with a straight course unto Cos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. And finding a ship sailing over uh, unto Phoenice, we went aboard and set forth. And when we had discovered Cyprus, we left, we, we, we left it on the left hand. So they're sailing back to Phoenicia. They left Cyprus on the left hand. So they must have sailed south of Cyprus. And they sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid, uh, what was uh, to unlaid uh, her, her burden. So Adramitium is, as we say, just here on the western coast of Turkey, and the route taken would have gone uh, through the Aegean Sea uh, around to, 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 to the port of Tyre. Um, the Romans were, were well capable um, of actually sailing across the Mediterranean Sea and not keeping to the coast all the time. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, because of the wind conditions, it was advantageous for them to keep uh, to, the, to the coast. Now, on this slide, we see that um, the ship left Caesarea here and it sailed to Sidon. Uh, in Phoenicia. And that, that journey was a journey of probably about 69 miles, and it was, as we see uh, in, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27 and verse 3, they sailed that 70 miles uh, in a day. Um, so that was fairly good progress. And they would have taken advantage of the, uh, 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 of the westerly winds in order to achieve that. But as we, have, uh, as, as we read in verse uh, 
for um, uh, when we had la launched from thence, uh, we sailed under Cyprus uh, because the winds were contrary. So the Romans, as we say, were well capable uh, of uh, sailing on, the on what would be the, the quickest route under the south of Cyprus, which Paul had travelled before uh, to the coasts of Asia. But the winds were contrary. And so, as, as it says uh, in verse 4, they were forced to sail under Cyprus. Uh, and, and, and that means that they sailed under the lee of Cyprus and they kept it to uh, their left. And they did that because, principally because of the, uh, of, of the winds. Um, when it says in verse 4 that they sailed under Cyprus, again, that, that word under, it's a specialist nautical term. And it, what it means is they kept Cyprus between themselves and the westerly wind in order to take um, uh, advantage of more sheltered uh, conditions. And so the ship, the mariners, experienced mariners, used their knowledge of the sea and they chose this, which looks like the long route. They chose that because they knew because of the prevailing conditions that in, in actual fact, it was going to be the quickest route. So the sea diverted around the north, the ship diverted around the north of Cyprus and it then began to tack because you can't sail directly into a westerly wind. So it began to tack and it sailed through the sea of Cilicia uh, and Pamphylia, which you can see uh, at the top of the map there. And that is mentioned uh, in verse 5. They sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia and came uh, to, 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 to Myra. Now this uh, route gave uh, the ship another advantage because James Smith, in his book that I've already referred to, cites Nelson's second of command at the Battle of the Nile, uh, Sir James de Sormerez, as his maritime authority for the condition of the seas in the summer uh, 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 in the eastern Mediterranean. And Sormerez uh, records in his journals that the prevailing winds in this area of the Mediterranean during the late summer are westerly, and that would have prevented the uh, route to the south of Cyprus. And so they needed to sail through the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia. And sailing uh, under the lee of Cyprus, along the coast of Pamphylia, along here, would enable the captain to actually take advantage of local conditions because there's a wind that comes off the land here. And that would have helped their progress. And also, th there is a favourable current along that coast. And so here we have, brothers and sisters, maritime logic that would really only be known by experienced seamen, and it supports the authenticity of the record which we have in, in front of us. So they came to um, the city of Myra in verse 5, which is a, a city of Lycia. And that's on the map, and you can see it just here. Uh, it's the modern... Uh, Turkish town of Demri. That is the Myra uh, of uh, the, the, the scriptures. Now in the days of the Roman Empire, this was a flourishing seaport. Um, I'm using Google Maps, the satellite images on Google Maps to illustrate the address. Uh, and uh, what you have circled on the map in red just there is the ancient uh, part of Myra, that was the original Roman town. Uh, and the, there is a river here that you can see, that's the river Ad Adramitium, and the, the, the port of, of Myra was actually on that river. Well, it's si silted up now, and it's now about two miles from the sea. But that is uh, the port there, uh, on this river, uh, that the Apostle Paul would have sailed into. And you know, Myra was, a, was uh, a, a prosperous town uh, in, in those days. That's the, the picture of the now deserted harbour uh, where the Apostle Paul would have docked uh, in this ship. 
And that's a picture of the rather splendid tombs, the necropolis, which is at Myra, which evidences the, uh, the, 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 the importance uh, are, are, and, the, and the prosperity of this city in Roman times. And of course, uh, Romans ever lovers of supposed culture, they had their own theater. So it was a prosperous place in the days of the Apostle Paul. Now here we read that in verse six, they found uh, the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us uh, there, therein. So they changed ship to make further progress because the one they were in was only going to Adramitium. So they needed to change a ship and they found one that was bound for Italy, which is where they wanted uh, to go. So I've got there a picture of a Roman ship, uh, a, a Roman cargo ship, and it shows you the general shape uh, of the ship of Alexandria in which the Apostle Paul, Luke and Aristarchus sailed. It's very typical. It had a foresail here. It had two rudders there, and it had a single mast. And that is the basic format of a Roman uh, uh, cargo ship. But this ship, brothers and sisters, that the Apostle Paul sailed in was a large ship. And we know that it was a large ship because when we go to verse 37, we find that the ship was carrying passengers. And it had 200, three score and 16 persons on, on the ship. So it was a, a, a ship uh, of, of some size. It was a, a much larger proportion ship to the one uh, which is shown in, in this illustration. And you might well ask, well, did the Romans actually have ships of that size? Well, well yes, they did. Um, Lucian, a second century uh, Roman writer, uh, records that there was a sh that ships carried up to 600 passengers. And in fact, Flavius Josephus went to Rome on a ship that was carrying 600 passengers when he traveled there. But I devised a more thoughtful proof to, to show you that there were indeed large ships uh, in those days. What you see before you uh, is an obelisk, a red granite obelisk that stands uh, in the square at St. Peter's in Rome. I hope none of you have actually seen it in person. That obelisk is very old. It's Egyptian, about 4,000 years old, and it was transported by the Roman Emperor Cal Caligula in AD 37 from the Egyptian town of Alexandria to Rome and he transported it by ship. And it weighs 496 tons. It, 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 it's quite a size. It's 135 feet tall. And that is extant evidence of the size uh, of the Roman uh, cargo ships uh, of Paul's day. Well, what was this ship actually doing in Myra when it was a ship of Alexandria, one of the principal towns of Egypt, and it was bound for Rome or for Italy. Well, it's another hidden coincidence. The most direct route as the crow flies, if we can use that uh, phrase in, in a nautical address, uh, would have been across the Mediterranean Sea. But this was a commercial ship. It was carrying grain to, to, to Italy. And it, the sailors and the owners of this ship would have taken account of the wind conditions in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so the same conditions that had forced the ship which Paul was originally in uh, to dock at Myra and to pass over the north of Cyprus, the same conditions had brought that ship to Myra as well. It, it's an easily unappreciated coincidence that confirms the authenticity of the scriptures. And again, we see the, 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 the unseen hand of providence in this. If the winds had been favorable, Paul would never have arrived in Myra, and he would never have been in this ship of Alexandria. <coughs> but God commanded the winds to bring a ship of this type, a large ship to Myra, and to set the apostle on it because it suited his purpose to do it. 
And not only, brothers and sisters, was the ship suitable, the master and the owner of that ship were men of a certain character. They had some determination. As we are about to see in the account, they were what the world, I'm not sure I'm allowed to use this word, but I'm going to, they were what the world calls chances. They were prepared to take risks. Now you, brothers and sisters, you might not have liked the cut of their jib, as a sailor would say, but they were raised up to persuade a sensible centurion to sail when the season was almost over. And not all mariners would have done that. Again, this was all in the purpose of God. It is the hand, brothers and sisters, of providence. Now, loosing from Myra, again the winds were unfavourable. And I'm referring now to verse 7 of the narrative. Um, Acts chapter 27 and verse 7. And when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce would come over Snidus, the wind not suffering, we sailed under Crete over against Salone. The distance from um, that the, they were to sail from uh, Myra, which is just here, uh, to the next place that is mentioned, which is uh, Snidus, and it's, that's this peninsula here, and the port is on the end of the peninsula, that is a distance of 130 miles, 130 geographic miles. And with a fair wind, that would be about a day sailing, perhaps a little bit more. Remember when they went to Sidon, 70, 67, 70 miles, that, they did that in a day. So this wouldn't normally have taken any time at all. But it, it, it says in the text of verse 7, they sailed slowly many days. And that, as it says, was due to the wind not suffering, as the wind was contrary. But it seems, however, that they were able to make progress because there is a favourable current along this coast. There are calmer waters uh, that would enable them to sail closer to the wind. And again, brethren and sisters, we see the hand of God. This ship was being delayed. God was delaying this ship. And the delay of many days made the decision to press on with the journey at Fair Havens even more marginal than it might otherwise have been. Now, the ship would have been uh, protected from the extremities uh, of the adverse winds as it hugged the coast. But once it got beyond this peninsula, the peninsula of Snidus, uh, it was in the open sea. And it was subject to the full force of the weather. That's an aerial picture, by the way, uh, of the port of Snidus. And you can see it there right on the tip of the peninsula. And that's the place that's mentioned in, in, in verse 7. So, from Snidus onwards, the seas around Snidus, uh, the normal route which you would want to take... Uh, if you wanted to, to sail to, to Italy, was through the Aegean uh, arch archipelago. And that meant to sail from Snidus through the um, Aegean archipelago, north of, north of Crete, that meant that the ship had to go west by south. In other words, it had to go uh, in, this blue di in this direction of this blue arrow. That's where they needed to go. Uh, but... The wind was contrary. The wind was blowing from this direction. And because in Roman times, a ship could only sail to within seven points of the compass, uh, it meant that the ship could only go in the direction of the Red Arrow. They couldn't sail exactly where they want, wanted to. And we know that this, uh, from the text, because this, they sailed down to Crete, we know that it sailed in that direction, and therefore we know uh, that the, the wind must have been approximately uh, from the northwest. We can logically deduce that. 
So all they could do was to sail southwest by south, uh, or about 215 degrees. And that, that, that course, the best possible course, took them just to the, to the south of Crete, uh, to the point uh, of Salomon. So let's just see this on uh, uh, the Admiralty charts. Uh, for those of you in the room, the Admiralty charts are on display in the room. But for those of you on Zoom, I've managed to photograph them so that you can have an even better view than the brothers and sisters in the room. So here we are, look, circled in red, we have Snidus, where they were. This is the direction they wanted to sail in, through the Aegean archipelago. This orange arrow is the direction of the wind. And that, in a Roman ship, was as close to the wind as they could sail. And it may have been better for them to have gone along the north coast of, uh, of Cyprus, but the wind just wouldn't allow it. And the ship was forced to the south coast uh, 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 of Cyprus. So that's the route on uh, this next slide uh, that the ship uh, actually would have sailed. And you can see in more detail uh, the point uh, uh, the, the, of S S Salomone, uh, which is mentioned uh, in the text right at the end of verse 7. Now again, uh, I mentioned Sir James de Samarez, uh, uh, one of Nelson's captains, he sailed this exact route on his return from the Battle of the Nile. Sir James de Samarez was the second in command uh, at the Battle of the Nile, and he sailed in the ship. Uh, uh, he was the captain of the HMS Orion. And when he returned to, to Cadiz uh, um, from the Battle of the Nile, he tried the same route, uh, and he records in his journey in his journal, that he was forced by adverse winds, just the same as the Apostle Paul, to sail under the southern route or southern coast of Crete. Uh, and so the circumstances which are recorded in the scripture are not unusual. Even mariners in the 1800s, the late 1700s and 1800s, encountered the same uh, difficulties. And you'll find that recorded uh, in his journal entry dated the 28th of August, uh, 1798. Now, the, the south coast of Crete is, is what mariners call a weather shore. In other words, it's got a wind uh, coming off the land and it normally blows toward the south. Uh, and that wind would have enabled the ship to sail close to the, to, to the shore uh, as far as Cape Malata, uh, Matala, sorry, which is just here. I've circled it in red. And what actually happened is that they decided to dock at a place called Fair Havens just before they reached uh, Cape Matala. And we find uh, that that is, is recorded for us in verse 8. And hardly passing it, in other words, passing very, very close to this point, uh, Salmone, uh, they came to a place which is called Fair Havens, and it's just there on the south coast of Crete, which was nigh to, the pla to a city called uh, 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 Lassia. So, that's a, a picture uh, of... Fair Havens. It's not really a harbour, it's more, it's more of a bay. And the problem with, with Fair Havens is that it's exposed to the south and it's not really suitable to, to, to winter a large grain ship in. Uh, and you find that that was the problem because in verse 12 it says that this haven, Fair Havens, was not commodious to winter in. And so they were in this bay just here. Uh, but it wasn't really suitable uh, to spend the whole of the winter in that bay because it offered very little uh, protection uh, from uh, the, the, the winds. 
Now, the difficulty of going beyond Cape Matala was that the ship needed to sail northwest uh, to keep to the coast and to reach its destination. But the prevailing wind was northwesterly. And so the safest thing to do, really the safest thing to do, despite the poor anchorage, was to stay put. The season was far spent. It was now getting late in the season. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul uh, advised uh, the captain of the ship, the owner of the ship, and the centurion to do. Verse 9. But now, uh, when the much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, it had gone past the fast, which is the Day of Atonement. Uh, so you're looking at late September, early October now of that year. Uh, Paul admonished them. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading of the ship, uh, the, the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master, that's the captain, and the owner of the ship, more than the thing, those things which were spoken of uh, by Paul. So it was late in the season now. It was past the Day of Atonement. Uh, and James Smith, uh, as a mariner, states that Paul's advice to stay put would have been supported by virtually every sensible mariner. But you see, the master of the ship and its owner had a valuable cargo of wheat, and it was destined for Italy. They were concerned as well about the, safe, the safety of fair havens. And they knew of a much better anchorage at a place called Phoenice, and which is mentioned in verse 12. And they hoped that they might attain to this anchorage at Phoenice and winter there. It's a haven of Crete, as it says, and it lies toward the southwest and the northwest. Well, Phoenice is the... Uh, modern Port Lutro, and I'm sure, th this is Fair Havens, which where the ship was, and that is Phoenice. There, and you, can, you might just be able to see on the map. There's, a, there's a, a, an indent in the coast, a cove there, and that is Port Lutro. And uh, the, the the benefit of Port Lutro is, as it says. It lies toward the southwest and northwest. Well, that doesn't really make sense in the authorised version, but the narrative is written from, the, from a sailor's perspective. It's written as if you were in the sea looking at the land. Uh, and what, what it means is that this particular harbour, um, protected from the southwest winds and the northwest winds, uh, and... I've got a picture of it here, look, and you can see it really is a tight cove and it offered really good protection uh, from the dangerous winds in the area. And you can also see that it was of ample size to, to, to shelter a large Roman ship. Well, what happened next? Well, in, in verse uh, 13, a wind came. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they have obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. What a coincidence, brothers and sisters, just when there is this marginal decision about to be made, a lovely, lovely south wind starts to blow. And this, brothers and sisters, was providence. It was providence enticing men through circumstance to act against their better judgment. You see, loosing from fair havens was crossing the Rubicon. It was the point of no return for this vessel. And so they got underway, as it describes in verse 14 of the narrative. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And so, as we're about to see, their attempt to sail close to the coast was going to be thwarted uh, by a wind called the Euroclidon. Now, originally, 
uh, they would have sailed, uh, in order to get to Phoenice here, they would have sailed along the coast from Fairhaven, and then they would have uh, sailed in a north, uh, uh, west, northwest direction. Uh, and the south wind would have, would have been perfect for them to achieve uh, that uh, purpose. But look at what it says uh, in verse 13. It says, uh, sorry, verse 14. It says, not long after. Uh, and that phrase, not long after, is a relative term. And it means that they could only just really have left. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the bay at Fairhaven. And it certainly means that they were less than halfway. So we know more or less exactly where the ship was when the Euroclydon started to rear its, its ugly head. The, the destination, Port Lutro or Phoenice as it is in the scriptures, was only 38 miles away and they would have been less than half that distance, less than 17 miles on that course, uh, when this fearsome uh, uh, sh uh, uh, wind started to drive the boat. And that, that wind, as we can see, drove them to a certain island called, uh, 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 that they were driven, uh, 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 as it says, in verse 16, under a certain island which is called Clauda, and we had much work to come by the boat. Now, when you, when you look at the charts uh, and you look at the island of Clauda, which is now known as Gavdos, just here, uh, you can see that if the ship was driven past this island, uh, then it must have been blowing them away from the coast of Crete. And their best e e e endeavours uh, were resorting in a west-southwest course. So from their estimated position here and their course to the south of Clauda, James Smith estimates that the Euroclidon was an east-northeast wind. It must have been to get them... Uh, past the island uh, 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 of Clauda. So that's the direction there, that the wind, the Euroclidon, must have been blowing in. Now when we look in detail at verse 14, this wind is called a tempestuous wind. And the Greek word for tempestuous is tuphonikos. And it's where we get our word typhoon from. So this was a typhoon or a hurricane strength wind that was blowing. So it really was a serious issue. And James Smith states in his book that that, that change uh, from a gentle south wind to a northern tycoon is not unknown in those waters at that time of year. It's entirely plausible and feasible. Now, most ancient manuscripts uh, in, in, in verse 14, most um, ancient manuscripts have for Euroclidon, Eurocylon. It's, it's the same word, just, it's just got a slightly different spelling. And that uh, variance in spelling to Eurocylon is supported by the three main, three of the main unical codices, A, B, and Aleph. It doesn't actually appear in, the word doesn't actually appear in uh, the codices C and D. So the most ancient manuscripts do support the reading uh, that James Smith uh, uh, suggests. And Eurocylon is, is a Greek uh, name, a Greek term for a Roman term. And the Roman term is Euro Aquilo. And Euro means east, and Aquilo means northeast. And so if you accept the reading of Euro Cylon, the meaning of Euro Cylon is east, northeast. And that is exactly what we think uh, this strong wind was. And that interpretation must be correct, given our knowledge of where the ship was 
and where it was driven to. And so once again, uh, we see that an intimate knowledge of the seas evidences the Bible record. But the question is, brothers and sisters, where was this wind going to take them? And that we shall discover in our next address, God willing. Thank you.